So, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting to see how uh, this day has progressed. This has been an interesting sermon to put together, um, and uh, um, then an interesting day to present it. It's just been a little disjointed. Um, things have the enemy has done the best to kind of keep us off kilter, and um, I, I'm excited about this sermon. We're wrapping up um, Second John today, but uh, as we get ready to start, I want to remind us what we looked at last week. Remember, we saw that John, in his closing, is really saying, guard this doctrine of Christ. Guard the doctrine of Christ. Don't forget to say to that what we believe, Jesus actually came in flesh, in a human body. He died. He was buried. He, was, he, he rose again. All of that for me has propitiation. He did it to, to um, save me. And that's the doctrine of Christ. In fact, if anybody comes up from within you, you're going to you're gonna have to put them out. But put them out with the idea that we're going to let them know, listen, you are messing around with the eternal um, uh, security of people, the eternal fate of people. You, you need to get this right because if you don't, we can't have you around dragging people out into busy roads where they're going to get run over. But we also have to watch those coming in, right? And if they come in and they present something, we, we just say, well, you're, see ya. We keep them out. That's a harsh sermon to give. But like I said last week, it's like grabbing a five-year-old by the arm and saying, don't go out there. Don't go out in that busy street. You're going to get hurt. And it might have scared people. It might have upset people. But I'd rather have you scared and upset and know the truth than to wander out into the street and lose your salvation. Okay? So, this week, John is really wrapping the book up with this. He gets back to the tenderness of, of the elder. <clears throat> so, I'm going to read uh, the last two verses uh, Brother Ed read us the second to the last verse, but I'm going to read through it um, in Second John uh, 12 and 13. I thought I had it marked. It says this, Having many things to write to you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come to you and speak face to face that our, that our joy may be full. The children of the elect sister greet thee. Amen. So, <clears throat> again, here's um, John um, giving these terms of endearment that how much he just wants to be with them. And I think this is something that uh, we've gotten away from a little bit. Okay, this um, idea of fellowship, face to face. Now, this literally, the, the um, Greek um, euphemism is, is mouth to mouth. But, but really, we don't say, I want to talk to you mouth to mouth. We, we talk about face to face, right? But the idea here is that that interchange physically, in, in, in physical uh, proximity to each other, that we get together and we, we do that together, right? So um, this is a, a very tender message he offers at the end of his letter, and that desire to be physically present with people, uh, especially those he loves. Now, this is not unusual. Uh, Ed said, you know, this is 90 AD. This is after the fall 
of the, the destruction of the temple. But the early church did this a lot. It was an early church practice to meet together and be together face to face. <clears throat> In Acts 2.42, we see right after that great sermon that Peter preaches on Pentecost, the result is um, that they, the, the people who heard and were baptized and believed, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayers. So they devoted themselves um, to fellowship, to fellowship. The apostles' teaching, fellowship, to prayer, breaking of bread, they, they met together. And that is something that was important. In fact, in Ephes or Acts chapter 4, um, right after Peter and John had been sent in front of the council and told, don't you speak in that name anymore, they get, they get whipped and they get sent out. And what do they do? In uh, Acts 4, 23, it says, and when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, they began to pray together. See, <clears throat> that's what happens when the Spirit of God moves. He brings people into fellowship. Isn't that what we read? In the first letter, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. That's the part that, that um, the Spirit of God does. He brings us together. In fact, in Romans, Paul, uh, Paul kind of lays it out for the church. Um, he says this, Let love be genuine, Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with a brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek how to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. I like um, how the New Living will say, uh, don't be too important to hang out with ordinary people. And never be wise in your own sight. Don't think you know too much. So again, we see even Paul talking to the Romans. Uh, we see the believers in Jerusalem in Acts. We see Paul talking to the believers in Rome saying, listen, it's hospitality and being together and rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep and being together. That's how he keeps going. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So that's the call to have fellowship and live in peace with each other. So that's the New Testament church. And why does, look at what John says. Why does he want to get together with them face to face? To give them instruction? Yeah. He says, you know, I would not write with paper and ink, having many things to write to you. I would not have um, to write with paper and ink. But I trust or I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy, our joy may be full. There's something about it. Tip said it this morning. Um, the... Uh, Internet's fine, and, and uh, Luella said it, you know, it's nice, you know, we can see it on Facebook or, or YouTube or whatever, but it's not the same, right? Being here and hugging necks and, 
and encouraging each other and, and loving on each other. That's um, what we're called to, that fellowship, that fellowship. So we see it in the early church, but we experience it today. We experience it today. But see, this is not unusual. It's a Jewish tradition. The, the um, commanded uh, pilgrimages, we kind of, we've kind of studied those in our, in our uh, um, evening Bible study. In Deuteronomy 16, 16 is the, the scriptures say that the God told them three times, three times a year, all your males are to appear before the Lord your God. That's the blank. The Lord your God. You're to appear before the Lord your God. All y'all together. I don't think it says all y'all. But that's what it means. <clears throat> In fact, three times a year, all the males um, had to appear before the Lord um, in Jerusalem, they usually brought their families with them. It was a big pilgrimage, uh, Passover, Pentecost, uh, and tabernacles or atonement. They were there three times a year, all getting together. All of them getting together. In fact, Psalm 120 through 134, they're called the Psalms of Ascent. I don't know if you've ever... Notice in your Bible, as you read them, they, they have this little header, Psalm of Ascent, Psalm of Ascent. And tradition has that um, these 15 psalms, Psalm 120 through 134, um, the pilgrims would sing as they ascended, ascended the hills to Jerusalem. Jerusalem's on, on a hill. And, and as they were coming from all around, from everywhere in Israel, when they were coming to their the to Passover or Pentecost or or Tabernacles uh, atonement, they would ascend the hills to Jerusalem and they'd sing these psalms. Now, some say, well, it wasn't only that. the The Levites would sing as they ascended the steps into the sanctuary. As they ascended, there was. 15 steps up into the sanctuary. They would sing these psalms as they would enter. But the thing is, um, in these psalms, look look at uh, just, I just did a couple here. Uh, Psalm 122, verse 1. These are, are probably familiar to you. Um, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Let us go. Let us get together. In Psalm 133, toward the end of the Songs of Ascent, um, it says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity, that fellowship. And then Psalm 134, all three verses. Come bless the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made the heaven and earth. That idea of being together, worshiping together in the holy place. That fellowship. It was a, a Jewish tradition as well as this Christian early church doing it. And we get to experience it today. We get to experience it today. And that's why I think in Hebrews... The writer is telling the Hebrews <clears throat> in Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of son, some but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Um, uh, Jackson read it to us this morning, right? Jackson read this to us this morning. That we need to um, stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together. We, we need to get together if at all possible. 
Now, this is where my sermon was like, well, how, how do I express this? And um, then I thought back to some of the things that we've talked about as we've studied these letters. In 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3, um, Peter is telling this to elders. So I ex exhort the elders among you as a, fellow, as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, whew, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not, as, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Now, why in the world would I think of this when I say, do not neglect the meeting together. The reason I think that, that I think this scripture came to me is because you need to be part of a flock. You need to be part of a flock. God set shepherds to shepherd the flock. You need to be part of one. That, that's where the fellowship comes that's where the protection and the example and the, the um, uh, meeting each other's needs and, and watching over one another, that's where that comes in, being part of a flock, um, being part of a um, body of believers. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, um, Paul is giving this example of a human body. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12, he says, For just as the body, this, this body, is one with, and has many members, right? I have fingers and toes and nose and ears and eyes, lots of, lots of members. And all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one members, but many. In fact, he goes on to give some examples of how that body interacts with each other. And then he says this down in verses 26 and 27. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. That's the idea. We are all the members of Christ, but individually we are members of it. And we could say that of a local congregation. Where our local congregation is part of the body of Christ individually, but we're all part of the bigger body of Christ collectively, right? So the idea here is um, being together as a body would be together. Now, um, I'm going to uh, uh, give it away. Um, I really like how the King James reads um, first. Corinthians 12, 27. And the reason I'm going to take time to go there is um, <clears throat> it says, now you are all members of Christ and members in particular. And members in particular. That's going to be our sermon series starting in 2024. The body of Christ and members in particular. We are going to study what it means to be the body of Christ and members in particular. Okay? So there. Now, now I've set you up for next year. Only two months away. But that, that's where we're going in 2024. The body of Christ and the members in particular. But it applies today because we want to talk about how we are to be in fellowship one with another, just like our body is. And I don't want to give away all my thunder, but, um, you know, um, when one part suffers, we all suffer. 
that that's the thing. Um, I want you all to know you're as necessary to this body as my heart is to me. When you're gone, we're missing something. Yeah. Pat and, and Les and the Browns and the Woodworths and the uh, Linda T. I mean, did anybody even say anything about praying for the unspokens? Right? See, everybody has a part. And when they're gone, we, we're missing something. You, I'm preaching 2024 already. But that's where we're going, okay? And why, why would we talk about this? Like I said in our bulletin, 2 John 1, 12, that our joy may be full, complete. Now, <laughs> it's great, though, that um, Jim and the well are here because they can testify. Same with Tip. I'm glad she's here. They're, they are great object lessons for us today because in Colossians chapter 2, verse 5, Colossians 2, verse 5, Um, Paul says this, Colossians 2, verse 5. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the fit firmness of your faith in Christ. So though I am absent in body, I am with you in spirit. Now, I'm not saying that you cannot be part or have part in a distance and have fellowship, all right? Tip has been able to listen online. I know it's not the same, but at least it keeps you connected. Same with the Fullers. They can listen online. You can be absent from the body, but still be present in spirit. Um, Paul says it again in 1 Corinthians 5.3. He says... You know, um, he says, for though I'm absent in body, I'm present in spirit. And as if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. So that even though he was distant from him, he was so involved with them that he was able to pronounce judgment on something that was going wrong in the church. See, you don't always have to be present, I guess is what I'm saying. Though, though your joy is, our joy, not your, our joy is full when you are. But um, again, um, I have to think about participation through distance. Uh, Grandma Rosie um, Segner, we pray for her every week. She's battling cancer. Trevor's grandma, every Sunday, I'm saying almost every Sunday without fail, she's on Facebook watching us, saying, hello, Mansfield Family Church. Diana Sampson, Kevin's sister, always is listening online, and she'll make a comment. Ruth Fisher, Jeanette's sister, Jeanette Cavadini's sister, hello, Mansfield Church. Joy Cook, Diana Michelson's sister. Hello, what a great uh, word, or it's good to see Pinky, or whatever, you know, participating online. Uh, Pam Hicks, Pam Bartley Hicks. Good morning from Arizona, right? Jolene and J.R. Argo. Jim, uh, John and Gina Wallace. Half the time, they'll say good morning. That's Luella's uh, grandkids. Grand, great, just grandkids. I, have to, I miss uh, Selma Miller-Smith watches online. Barb Webley, who, who really needs us right now. Dawn passed away, and now she, she fellowships with us because she's been housebound with her husband, couldn't get out, gets online to watch church. 
Um, um, uh, who else did I put down here? Um, oh, Richard Hartman reached out to me, a guy from Australia. Been listening to our Sunday school and our church services because he can't get to a church. The, the thing is, I drew a line back up to the body of Christ and members in particular that we're going to talk about in 2024. We have to, I have to, me and the elders, have to figure out how we can make that distance fellowship more meaningful. We need to connect with those people and, and, and meet with those people and talk to those people, whether it's just electronically. The thing is, um, you know Greg and Don are going to watch this. Um, uh, um, anybody who misses um, that aren't here, there's a lot of our congregation. If they're sick or can't be here, they'll watch online. The thing is, it's not that I'm saying I need to have your fanny in a seat every Sunday. But you need to know that when you're not here, it, you're missed. And um, I was talking, uh, what, really, what really led me to this is I was talking to somebody um, about a month ago and asked, how, how are you doing? How, how are things going? Are, are you going to church? Well, not regular. And I said, you, you, need to, you need to go. They need you. Well, what do you mean? I said, they need you. And I opened up uh, 1 Corinthians 12, and I read it to her, and I said, look, they, you, you're part of that body. You, you need to get, get back there with them. They need you. I've never been told that. I said, well, I'm telling you. They, they need you. You need to be back there fellowshipping with them. They need you. They're missing you. Well, nobody ever said. I said, that doesn't mean they don't. Maybe they're so busy and you have to give them a little grace. They, they're, they're trying to survive without you. They need you. And it made me think. You all need to know. You're necessary. Don't you ever think that, oh, I can miss. It's no big deal. You're needed. I never want anybody here to say, well, I've never been told that. You are needed. You are loved and you are missed and you are necessary. And we're going to spend 2024 figuring it out. Because look at how John ends this. I, I hope, I trust that I can be with you face to face. So our joy can be full. And then he ends the book with <clears throat> children of the elect sister greet you. Now, it kind of goes back to the beginning. Whether or not he was talking about an elect lady, an actual lady, and her sister, I don't know. Maybe she was. Maybe he was. Maybe he's actually, but maybe it's a term of endearment for the local body of Christ. And he's saying, you know, here I am with this other body and they love you like family and they send their greetings to you too. Right? That's why when this lady and I were talking, I didn't say, well, why don't you get over here and come to church? You need to get yourself in church. You know what? They, they need to be with the, their body. Our, our family in another building that's where she belongs. We just, we just need to love each other and make sure everybody knows they are necessary. Amen? So, with that, 
I'm going to ask the musicians and the singers to come. And we're going to sing chorus 194, He is our peace. Chorus 194, He is our peace. <laughs> that you can send, that peace that passes all understanding will just rule and reigns in our hearts and our minds, especially in these times of trouble. But Lord, we also look to be able to be together so that we can encourage each other to love and good works, especially as we see the day approaching. Lord, help us to fellowship with each other in sincere love and truth. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.